The following audio is from Shiloh Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. More information about Shiloh Presbyterian Church is available at shilohopc.org. Please remain standing as we read God's Word together. You'll find it on page 842 if you're using a pew Bible. Again, if you're visiting, welcome. Good to see you here this morning. Good to have you with us. We are studying the second book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Mark. And we'll be studying verses 24 through 30 here this morning. This is God's inspired and therefore inerrant word. You can build your life on it, so listen carefully. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the living God shall stand forever and ever. Let's pray. Our great God in heaven, we love this story because we find ourselves in it as we do in every part of your word, but most importantly, we find Christ in it. Christ for us, the one who has become for us wisdom and righteousness and holiness from you, our Father. Bless us with an increased knowledge and love for him this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Let me ask you a question. What is the worst insult you have ever endured in your life? All of us immediately can call to, time, call to mind times in our lives where somebody has just said something so hurtful and so insulting that you'll never forget it. You children know what I'm talking about, too, because that's where it starts, doesn't it? When we're little kids, we say mean things to our brothers and sisters, and the only reason we say them is to hurt the other person, to insult the other person. Somewhat shockingly, we come to an insult here in Scripture this morning. If you pick up a commentary on Mark 7, 24 through 30, you'll find about as many different opinions as to what's going on here as there are commentators. And so I hope we can navigate uh, well through the choppy waters of this text. I honestly am not trying to, I don't have any special wisdom or insight, but I think it's a lot easier than, you know, typically what scholars do. They make simple things hard and hard things simple sometimes. So we'll try to navigate through this, and I want to look at this text under three headings with you this morning. Humble faith's urgency in the first place, in verses 24 to 26. Humble faith's urgency. Humble faith's pleading in 27 to 28. Humble faith's pleading. And then in 29 to 30, humble faith's reward. So urgency, pleading, and reward each two verses. Look back with me there at verse 24. And remember where we are here in Mark's gospel. He's gone from very Jewish settings now over to the Gentile region. Okay, That's where we find him. Remember we talked last week, the whole, or the last couple weeks, the whole episodes with the Pharisees are all designed to set us up for what's coming next, these miracles among the Gentiles. So Jesus rearranges the Pharisees and the typical Jewish understanding of the law in service of preparing people to understand his mission, not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. By the way, what's a Gentile? Everybody sitting here. All of us. As far as I know, nobody here is full Jew, and I'm not even sure we could establish that in our day and age. But in any case, it's for us. It's for Gentiles. Now notice what happens. There was, he rose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, Mark's favorite word, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon 
out of her daughter. We don't know why Jesus wanted to rest at this point in his ministry. I think a good guess is that he is exhausted. As we've seen throughout the whole of Mark's gospel, he gives us a Savior who, to borrow the terminology of the later church creed, is fully human and fully divine. He's one who's fully God, and yet he gets tired. He gets thirsty. He is a man, a person, a human being, just like us. He enters a house and doesn't want anyone to know, and yet because of what he's been doing, he cannot be hidden. People are coming from him, to him. And we read that immediately this woman comes who has a little daughter with an unclean spirit. Now, in, in the original, there's little daughters, there's little crumbs, and there's little dogs. That's the same kind of construction in the Greek. That's how Mark structures this narrative. So she's got this little girl probably under the age of 10, as best we can tell. And everything, beloved, about this woman is wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. If you're a Jew in the first century, if you're a Jewish rabbi in the first century, like Jesus is, she is wrong times 10. They don't deal with people like this. Why? First, because she's a Gentile. I could sit here and read to you from the early commentaries around the time of Jesus by the rabbis on what they think about people who were not Jews. They're unclean simply by the fact that they're not Jews. They don't have to go and do the hand, not do the hand washing and all the other stuff the Pharisees prescribe. Even apart from not doing that, they're unclean simply by who they are. It's difficult to imagine a more vitriolic form of racism than this. Simply because they weren't Jewish, they are not clean. Second, she's from Syrophoenicia. Now, this region was hated even more than the other Gentile regions, if possible. Why? Because in Syrophoenicia, they quite literally lived off the bread of Galilee, where Jesus was from. So Galilee would produce the bread, and the Romans would take it and distribute it to the Syrophoenicians. They worked really hard. The Syrophoenicians got all the money. So she was from a wealthy Gentile region. Let me try to bring this up to date for you a little bit. Imagine somebody from the Upper West Side of Manhattan going down to the Bedford Story of Byzant neighborhood in Brooklyn, one of the worst neighborhoods in this country, and going to somebody there who's a minister and saying, would you please heal my little daughter? What do you think would happen most of the time if a congregation was watching this happen? You're a millionaire from the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Why do you need us? Why are you coming here? And yet it's at this point, I think, that all of us can sympathize with this woman, if you're a parent especially. If you look at a child and you are even in the least bit human and you see a child suffer, your heart goes out to that child, doesn't it? You children, you wonder why your mom and dad get so excited and upset sometimes if you're running towards the street. It's because they care about you and they want nothing to happen to you. And your parents will go to any lengths whatsoever to make sure you are well. They will do anything for you. And it's the tenderness of humanity that is brought out when we see a child sick or suffering. And remember, this child has a demon. Okay, this is where one time maybe we're a little close to the Hollywood aspect of things. We read about this in the rest of the Bible. When a demon comes along upon somebody, especially when Jesus is dealing with that demon, it's not a pleasant experience. Imagine a little child tortured and racked with pain, unable to eat or drink. And imagine you're that child's parent, and you hear about this Jewish rabbi, even though you think to yourself, there's no way this, this, this guy's going to hear me. I'm from everything's wrong. She knew this. She's not ignorant of what Jewish people thought about her. She's been brushed off by rabbis before. Doesn't matter. It's her daughter. It's her child. She's racked with pain. She's being tortured by a demon. She needs help. You see, the urgency that this woman comes with is a mark of truly humble faith. It doesn't consider where it comes from. It doesn't say, you know, that's a barrier, that's an obstacle, I won't go. No, faith that Jesus accepts is humble enough to say, I don't care. All I want to do is be near him. And you see, Jesus, as he's going to heal this little girl, and when she comes to him, believing him, 
that he can do this. It reminds us, Mark does this so often in his gospel. He's saying again and again to us, when you read the Old Testament, when you look at the prophets of the Old Testament, specifically Isaiah, they kept talking about a time when creation would be made right. And Isaiah says it's going to happen in stages. It's going to begin with the coming of the suffering servant. And then at one day coming in the future, all the sickness and suffering and demon possession, it's all going to be gone. And what Mark is doing here is saying, Jesus is the one who brings that in. He's the one who makes it possible. He brings healing and wholeness to this broken world. Do you hate the devil? I don't ask if you believe in the devil. You better believe in the devil if you want to be a Christian. Because he's real and he's active. And he's after every Christian. Make no mistake, you are caught in warfare. And if that sounds strange to our modern scientific ears, then so be it. He's a real devil. Do you hate him? When I watch what sin does to people, I hate the devil. I hate what he does against me in my own life and struggle with sin. Jesus hates the devil. He's a murderer from the beginning. And he comes here to assert his authority over the kingdom of Satan. That is a constant theme in Mark's gospel. Do not be offended by it. Receive it. Believe it. See what Jesus does. And so this woman is providentially by God brought to the point of desperate need. You ever been there? It might not be a sick daughter. It might be something else. But God in his wise providence brings you to the point of being in desperate need. And the only person who can help you at that point is Jesus. That's what we all have to realize. God does not bring us through trials or put us in straits of desperate need because he's a masochistic God who likes to watch us suffer. That's not why he does it. We'll talk about this tonight in the evening sermon. Trials are necessary, Peter's going to tell us. But God brings us to this point so that we might be reminded of how desperate is our need for Christ. Of how we are so absolutely self-insufficient to do what God calls us to do. So if that's where God's bringing you this morning, rejoice. Don't give up. It means he's trying to tell you and I something when he does this. He's bringing us closer to himself. He's saying, cry out to my son. Well, in the second place then, look at faith's humble pleading. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat this children's crumbs. I love this passage. And I absolutely am intrigued by this woman's response. This, this is one of the most fascinating instances recorded for us in the gospel. Let's, let's, um, let's go through this. Jesus insults her here, if we can use strong language. Okay? Now, commentators go, no, he's testing her faith. No, 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 no. Don't de-Judaize Jesus. Okay? He is a Jewish first century rabbi. Now, he's different than all the rest. He's the son of God incarnate. But never forget that the scriptures make clear when God sends his Messiah, it's to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, as Paul tells us in Romans 1. And it's just because we have so many Gentile prejudices that this offends us. And we're going to see in a moment how this woman models what true faith should be like. But we can't soften the force of this. Jesus calls her a dog. He says, this is what those outside the covenant are like. Now, again, people say, well, that's not the gentle Jesus. This is not a good news. This is not a gracious Savior. I don't want to come to him. I hope by the end of things you realize that's not at all what we're meant to conclude as this incident shows us. Instead, we're to see the grace of Jesus in all this. But, but realize something here. You and I are stepping into a story with a cultural background that is not assumed by Jesus. He does not assume that all people are created equal. There was no declaration of independence. Like all the Jews of his day, they were God's special people. He chose them out from among the nations. You see, election was offensive long before John Calvin ever took up his pen. It's been there for all time. God comes to Abraham out of all the nations of the earth, out of all the peoples, he comes to Abraham and chooses him out and then brings about the nation of Israel from that. And they are different from the world. And that is offensive to people because we love equality. That's a good thing. So does God. But when it comes to who he saves, it's up to him, not us. And you will either have a God who is unfair or you'll have an idol. 
And a God who is unfair is the only kind of God you want to serve. Why? Because if God ever gave us what was fair, there would not be a single solitary soul who would ever be saved. In fact, I'll put it this way. The essence of grace is the fact that God is unfair. So he chose the nation of Israel for himself. And when he sends Jesus forth, and remember Mark's writing to a Gentile audience. Imagine how they received this. Picture yourself as a first century Roman reading this and you think we are the greatest nation to ever exist and this guy who I'm supposed to follow calls us dogs. And what's fascinating about this, Jesus isn't being rude. Let's be clear about this. I'm not saying insulting in the pejorative sense of the term. He just simply states a matter of fact. I want to be careful as I handle this. But look at what this woman's response is. Let me ask you, how many of you would have responded this way. Don't you love how she reasons with the Savior? Don't you love her boldness of faith here? You and I get called a dog. What are you going to do? <laughs> well, I'll go find it somewhere else. Clearly, Siren Phoenicia is better. We'll run away. What does she say? Yes. <laughs> yes, Lord. She agrees with him. Yes, you're right. I'm a dog. Yes, Lord. And then she just uses brilliant argument here. But even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She's not offended. She's the very picture of humility and understanding that's required by faith. And you know why Mark puts this here? He does this intentionally, by the way. He structured this. What did we just witness with the disciples? A bread miracle where he fed the 5,000. They saw all this bread. And what did they do? He's the Messiah. How could we miss it? No. No. They're still unbelieving. Here comes a woman who says, I don't even need to see bread. If I just see the crumbs, I'll believe. That's what's happening here. All she needs are, as it were, scraps from Jesus' table. And here's her reason. She says this, basically. If you're the Savior of Israel, Jesus, and I believe you are, even the leftovers from your ministry will be enough to heal my daughter. I don't need the full miracles. I don't need to be like the Jews. I don't even need to be that. All I need is the leftovers from your ministry. And that's enough. Can you imagine that kind of faith, beloved? Yes, I admit I'm not in the covenant. I'm outside of it. I'm a dog. It doesn't matter because you're enough, Christ. You're enough, Jesus. You alone can heal my daughter. And I believe that you are going to do it. And see what Mark's doing here? An unclean woman understands to a much greater degree than all the quote-unquote clean disciples ever have. Mark loves doing this. This is what the gospel does. The outsiders are in and the insiders are out. How does that apply to us today? If you come to church regularly and you think you're better than other people simply because you're around Christians, let me say it's the very opposite of the gospel. The very opposite of the gospel. Until and unless you own the fact that you're willing to recognize that you're a sinner, which is the modern equivalent of recognizing you're a dog, that you're not a good person, that left to yourself you will do evil, that left to yourself the very seeds of all kinds of evil are in your own heart. Until and unless you acknowledge that, you'll never be in the position of this woman. See, faith must begin in humility. Accepting God's assessment of ourselves. And that's the only way that outsiders become insiders, as it were. And that's what the gospel is all about. It turns everything upside down. And that's what this woman does. See, Jesus has crossed a boundary here, beloved. He's gone to a region where others wouldn't go. And he goes and accepts this woman. He says this to her. She shows great faith she's in. Do you notice that it's simple faith that causes Jesus to accept her? And even that's supplied by God. Simple faith, not your works, not where you're from, not your background, not your ethnicity, not how much money you make. None of that matters in the kingdom of God. None of it. None of that matters. God will not accept you because of those things. That's not how you can commend yourself to him because he gave all those things to you. There is. You're just a steward. How can the steward boast in a gift? That's the question. It's only when we humble ourselves and say, Christ and Christ alone is who I need and the only way to be saved. If you're not a Christian here this morning, 
welcome. I'm glad you're here. But here's the deal. We are, this is what we do here. This because this is a pretty typical Christian fellowship through the centuries. We're messed up. We've got a lot of problems. We're not pretty. This is, I'm never going to be, I'm not an entertainer. You can tell that. But what we have here is something called the gospel. And the gospel says very simply, you accept God's estimation of who you are, and Jesus accepts you as you are and then changes you. Isn't that good news? That you're not cleaning yourself up? That it's not what you do, but it's what God has done in Christ? That's what this woman recognized. And the last thing is this. Humble faith's reward. Look at verse 29. And he said to her, for this statement, <laughs> you, can, you can reason with Jesus. Don't you love that? You never reason with a pagan God. You offer sacrifices and hope for the best. You reason with the living God. This statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. She went home, found the child lying in bed, and the demon gone. You read it kid that was so sick, you take your child maybe to the emergency room, and there's that moment when things get better, and it's like the weight of the world is off your shoulders. I mean, you just feel like everything relaxed inside you because you're tense until that happens. Think about this woman. And notice what's happened here. Jesus answers and immediately commends her faith. He declares her daughter's, well, in direct response to her faith. And Jesus is doing that so we as his disciples realize what kind of faith he commends. And this is the kind of faith that Jesus accepts. It humbles itself. It's urgent. It pleads. It reasons. And most importantly, it comes to him with fear and reverence and says, I know you can do all things. And it takes him simply at his word. Isn't that what she does? She doesn't go, Hang on a second, let me go check. She goes. She, she says, your word is enough to heal my daughter. You don't even have to be there. Is Christ's word enough for your faith? As someone who engages a lot in apologetics and reasoning with unbelief, there is a place for that, and that is what God sometimes is pleased to use. People say people never reasoned into the kingdom. That is false. God may use our reasoning as part of our witness to bring people to himself. But let me say this as well. If you think that that's all you need to do, you're missing a part of the faith here. You see, what it comes down to is, do you believe God's word or not? That's what reasoning is all about. People disbelieve God's word. That's what an unbeliever is by definition. Maybe that's you. You don't believe his word. And if you're a Christian, you struggle to believe his word, maybe. Doesn't mean you're an unbeliever. It means we all are tested and tried in our faith. And when it comes down to the end of the day, you are banking your entire eternity on God's word. That's the stakes. If Jesus is a liar, we die, and that's it. He's not a liar. He's the living and true God. And here's the deal. If you don't believe his word, and we know he's not a liar, and he says, as we're going to read here in the next chapter, Mark 8, 44, or Mark 9, excuse me, when he says things like, they go where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, then that's what happens for those who don't believe his word. And it comes down to a very simple thing. Do you believe his word? And you say, how do I know do I believe his word? Do you have any desire to put it into practice? Yes, I realize we struggle and we fail to do so. Are you banking your life on his word? Do you strive to put it into practice every day? Do you realize that when you come to the Word of God, you're realizing His promises in your own life. You're to hang your life upon it, as it were. You're to come to this Word like this woman did, where it's just enough if Jesus says it. Is it enough for you? Is it enough for me? That simply on His own authority, we take Him at His Word. That, that's what this woman did. You, are you sure, Jesus? I'm not... None of that. Okay. You said it. It's happened. And the reward is she goes home and her daughter is made well. The passage teaches us something about ourselves and about our Savior. It teaches us that we deserve nothing. Nothing. Have you realized that? See, didn't that, didn't that cause so many problems in your life this week? I deserve a better spouse. 
a better car, a better vacation, a better life? Do you own the fact that you and I deserve one thing and one thing only, and that's the everlasting wrath of God abiding upon us? Does that offend you? Got to start there. That's the modern day equivalent, again, of being called a dog. That's offensive to us. It's offensive to our fallen natures. You and I deserve nothing. The great Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs preached about 500 years ago in London. Here's what he said. I am nothing. I have nothing. And I deserve nothing. That's the confession of faith where Christianity begins, beloved. You say, that's really depressing. No. It's only if you start there that grace will make any sense. We talk about that a lot here. And you see, it's pride that keeps us from believing this, isn't it? Don't you hate pride? Another Puritan, William Gurnall, said, Pride is the first shirt the soul puts on and the last it takes off. Don't you know that in your own experience? Think about how pride manifests itself in surprising ways. You may say to yourself this morning, Well, I, I'm worse than this Syrophoenician woman. You don't understand what I've done, Pastor. He can't forgive me. Do you see how that's proud? You're saying to the Savior, your blood and your righteousness are not good enough for me. I'd prefer to earn it. Somewhat ironically and surprisingly, that's how pride can manifest itself. Don't believe that lie. Forsake that. Forsake that kind of thinking and realize Christ came to save even the most vilest of sinners. The vilest offender, as we just sang, can truly be forgiven. That describes all of us here. And the woman and her faith teaches us what we, need to learn about our, what we need to know about ourselves in coming to Christ. We humble ourselves, we come in simple faith, and we believe his word. And all of it's from God, from start to finish. Maybe God is calling you to humble yourself this morning before him. Don't resist that. Don't worry about what other people are going to think. Don't worry about what your own pride is going to say to you. Christ came for sinners. You are a sinner. He is a gracious Savior. And that's the second thing here. This passage teaches us so much about our Savior. And that's strange because of Jesus' shocking reply. But what's more shocking is that he accepts the outsider. He accepts those who are not righteous. That's all of us are outsiders by that definition, aren't we? Jesus alone is perfect and holy and righteous and good. You and I are not. And yet he accepts the outsider. He accepts those who are not like him because he will transform them into those who can live with him forever. That's good news. That's mercy like the world's never heard. Bring, therefore, beloved, all your needs to him. Bring your desperate circumstances to him. Don't doubt his willingness to help even so great a sinner as you and I might be. Take his desperate need that he's placed upon you as evidence of his love and care for you and bring it to him and watch what he will do with it. Just like he did for this woman. That is why this story is in the Bible. It is to encourage your faith in the one who will accept us even when we're outsiders. That's the gospel, beloved. That's the one to whom we come. Therefore, humble yourselves this morning. What does James tell us? Humble yourself before God. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Humble yourself and realize Jesus is not offended by sinners. He came to save them and love them. Bring your needs and your sins to him. Trust his word implicitly. Do not give up trusting it. When needs and circumstances take you away from it, bring it back to that word. Hold on to that promise. Don't ever let go. Because God himself is holding on to you. And as you do that, realize that scraps from Jesus' table for dogs like us are better than the richest fare that this world could ever supply. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you don't just feed us scraps after the resurrection of Christ. We are welcome to the wedding feast of the Lamb. We look forward to that day when we will cast our crowns before him and say, you did it all. It's all of grace. Thank you for a Savior who accepts outsiders, and thank you for your word. We pray that you would bless it to our nourishment of our souls this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.